Great. Um, so what I want to do now uh, was sort of, uh, sorry, a little bit more about Flux. Um, you know, like I said before, we're focused right now on sort of data exchange, sort of the interoperability there. Um, but looking at that, um, you know, we see other problems as well as we've been working. So we can only develop so much so fast. We can obviously think a lot faster. Um, and so as we've sort of been talking to a lot of our clients, sort of looking at the design process as a whole, um, I think there's more to be, uh, more low-hanging fruit to reap and sort of improve the process um, than just making the bits flow a little faster, a little bit better. Um, so I want to sort of give you my perspective and share a little bit of what I see as sort of an outsider of the industry, as a software engineer in particular, um, on sort of how the current process is working, and you'll see one of the slides again. Um, but more importantly, I want to sort of challenge you with a slightly different perspective and a slightly different way of thinking about things that I think will bring uh, bear fruit in uh, helping sort of stimulate some conversation and how we can scale this industry or scale the process a little bit better. Um, you know, I think I want to step back even further and ask, you know, so why, why is this obsession with scaling? You know, sort of Flux is all about scaling architecture and I keep on talking about scale. And as a computer scientist, you know, it's important to me, but I think I want to sort of contextualize it and make it sort of why I think some very concrete tactical reasons. Um, you know, one I look at, you know, I, I would I, I challenge you to sort of comprehend doing a project with 150 designers on it and sort of imagine what that would look like. You know, and that's sort of the scale of some of the problems that we see when you solve it. Sort of, you know, would, imagine what you could do if you had that sort of size of a project. Um, so I think that's one big reason why you want to scale, just to consider the size. Um, but also there's, you know, people that you don't bring in until a lot later um, in sort of the process. You don't, you know, you, or you can't bring in at all. Um, so looking at how can you incorporate uh, sort of additional stakeholders into the process earlier on um, and sort of what's limiting us from doing that now. Uh, same with analysis, different sort of analysis programs don't run until much later on in sort of the, you know, when you're getting closer to sort of beyond schematic design, you start doing analysis to sort of validate it. But imagine if you, when you're doing schematic design, you could actually, or even earlier, you could actually sort of anal analyze sort of your rough model just to get feedback immediately on what's going on. Um, and finally, I would, I would challenge anyone to look at me with a straight face and say that you always use the best tool for the job, um, regardless of what, you know, what you're working on. I, I, it's very clear to me that um, most often you sort of have these discussions around you know, what version of Revit to use or sort of what tool can I, is the best one to use given what everyone else in the process is doing. And that's just not sort of a, a way to scale appropriately. Um, you know, so this is a slide, slide before, so I'll go really quickly through it. Um, you know, sort of in particular, I want to just hover, hone in a little bit more on the, the types of connections that exist. Sort of briefly try to color code it, but you sort of ignore that. Um, you know, you have, you have connections that are sort of the same machine, work very well. Um, you know, so Grasshopper to Rhino and uh, Dynamo, Dynamo to Revit and other tools that we just heard earlier. Um, that's a very fast sort of, you know, it's a nimble sort of the, the ideal way of getting data between the two tools. It's sort of just in memory, uh, just sort of works. Um, but that only works on a single machine. So if you want to have that same collaboration with Dynamo and someone else's Revit machine, you have to sort of go back to file-based exchange. Um, and sort of different things change as you sort of look across the industry, um, or sort of across the process. Um, you know, and there's been, you know, not to, not to look past it, there's been a lot of great developments um, you know, all the way from Lyrebird and Rhinomo, all the way to sort of the internal TTX tools that they've shared a little bit about, uh, that sort of do uh, help to solve this and sort of a file-based exchange manager. And we sort of heard some of the concerns about file-based exchange. Um, you know, and sort of just dwell there for a second. I want to sort of dive into it. actually what's looking, when you actually look at one of these uh, connections, you know, sort of, you know, I'm picking out designers working in Grasshopper and Rhino, and, you know, sort of wants to collaborate with a structural engineer who's using SAP 2000. Uh, you know, so right now, if they're going to collaborate and they need to work on their model, they'll, you know, choose a plugin, for example, Jump Your Gym, sort of, you know, export uh, through their, that process there, um, and everything's working fine and dandy. Um, but what if the designer actually really wanted to use uh, Dynamo for their work rather than Grasshopper? Well, they no longer can choose that tool. They have to change, choose a different tool because Geometry Gym doesn't yet exist for Dynamo. It doesn't sort of work in the same way for Dynamo. So they might, you know, use uh, TT's recently released Dynamo SAP tool. Um, but the point here is that what just happened when they tried to change the tool for a better usage, for a better reason, they also had to go back and re refactor the entire process to get that to work. Um, when, this is, when, this, when you look at this way, what I see when I look at this is I see a, a limitation to scalability. Uh, you, now, a change you want to make in one localized portion has rippling repercussions throughout the entire graph. You know, so um, if, if the structural engineer wanted to change uh, from SAP 2000 to ETABS or a different tool, and other people were factoring into that process, they'd all have to change their process for getting their file to them potentially. Um, and this sort of is a fundamental limitation uh, to scaling. Um, but if we step back and sort of look again at sort of, you know, Flux is looking at this as sort of, um, you know, transmitting the bytes and sort of looking at different, I think there's a separable concern here. That's sort of part of the re reason why we're running into these problems. Um, you know, there's a difference between sending the data around um, versus translating from the different formats. I think if we consider those two separate things, we can sort of see some um, roots and benefits and sort of several concerns in scaling. So I just sort of want to challenge and, leave that one thought there that, you know, 
the, the transmission of bytes is sort of one, I think, for, sort of mundane problem um, as far as architecture is concerned. I'm not sure anyone here is super excited about uh, solving that or making that better, uh, but Flux is very excited about that and it's something we'll be working on. Um, I think there's a great opportunity for um, building these different integrations and different translation tools on top of that sort of platform, on top of a better file exchange. Um, so that's one thought I want to sort of leave with you is sort of what can happen if we sort of start focusing as these, all these different operation tools as more of a translation layer exclusively rather than a translation and transmission. So we sort of stop worrying about the file. Um, but then if we actually go, dive into that, actually what would that mean going, going even deeper into the rabbit hole even further? Um, you know, even, even with that, even if we take away and we have we're working on great, we have some platform, we have some internal tool for doing the transmission that sort of abstracts away from that concern. Um, you still, as you try to, um, oops, um, you know, you're still tied to it, right? So for this, this, that, the problem we highlighted before hasn't gone away. If the designer wanted to move from back to Grasshopper, um, you would still have to refactor your entire process, or that sort of that one point-to-point -point solution uh, to work better. Um, you know, and often um, th that's because this translation requires sort of a cooperation between both the producer and the consumer um, of uh, the data. Um, you know, when just as simple as CSV, you know, when you're uh, writing out and reading back in, is it, is it sort of columns first, then rows, or is it rows first, then columns, you're sort of putting in a data, or, you know, an array. You sort of have to agree upon that for this sort of exchange of data to work. Uh, maybe not in this particular case, but in general. Um, this sort of creates a friction uh, between uh, the different users. And as you try to add new links to the graph, it only it sort of explodes on you. Uh, you have to have a lot of discussions. You sort of have to argue over what's the best way of doing the data. Um, and sort of limits how you can work and scale overall. Um, you know, if we take a step back and look at uh, how software works and sort of how we've sort of solved these problems. You're all familiar with this. We talked talk about APIs. Um, but if you actually look down, you know, um, API stands for Application Programming Interface. And really, this concept of an interface is sort of pervasive. But in software in particular, it means drawing a boundary around your, your world and defining, putting strict sort of uh, definitions on what you'll take and how you work, and defining a, sort of a contract with how people who want to work with you uh, can talk to you. And you'll sort of promise a sort of a service level or the way you'll sort of, uh, how you'll work, um, as long as they sort of prescribe and write to your sort of interface. So it's sort of in software, there's this term of programming to the interface, sort of doing your, doing coding, uh, writing your application in such a way that it's using this third-party service, but you don't have to worry about the implementation detail. For example, Oculus is such a complex device, and yet you can do so many powerful things with it because you don't have to worry about how it's implemented in these sort of internal uh, operations of it. Um, you know, and you sort of also have a very concrete example of this in, you know, in Grasshopper. Every block uh, set up a set of interfaces, a, a very well-defined set of inputs that if you provide and you sort of put in a certain format, uh, the block will execute as expected and produce the output as, as it tells you. You don't have to worry about how the block works internally and sort of provides a level of sort of separation of, uh, sorry, uh, abstraction. You don't have to worry about necessarily how the thing internally uh, works. Um, so if we kind of look and bring this back to the problem, actually we start to look at the tasks that the designer and the structural engineer are, are working on as sort of self-contained operations or logic, and you define a boundary around them, sort of this interface around them. Um, you know, and the sort of the designer says, I'm going to provide this data on, on my output of this certain format. This is what it's going to look like. And then the structure says, okay, fine, how I, that, and this is how I take it. And you put Geometry Dream or one of these tools, and there's a separate operation that does a transformation, a translation. That, you know, and you sort of line up the interface in this way. Um, then you can see it was actually no problem at all for them to start using Grasshopper. As long as the designer, who has the onus on them, to pr produce the data in the same format as they initially prescribed that they would do, then you don't have to the structural engineer doesn't have to change at all. Now you sort of start to see how you can sort of swap things out and change things around um, and add new links without having to sort of readjust the entire process. Um, and you know, sort of if we squint and go back sort of that initial diagram ahead and start drawing sort of boundaries around this way, um, you'll start to see that actually if we sort of, you know, with this sort of abstraction, this sort of new or new way of looking at things, we can abstract away um, and sort of start breaking things down into these smaller tasks. Uh, we sort of get this freedom of sort of, um, you know, as we abstract, sorry, as we, as we lose the, the care about what, what tool each designer is using, we can sort of start looking at what links can we add to this graph um, and sort of look at it more like a grasshopper script, sort of, you know, with this flow-based thing, or sort of, you know, sort of uh, uh, came back around and sort of looking at this. Now I can sort of track away and sort of stop worrying about the particular tools and the particular ways in which the designers and the different people are completing their tasks and look more at the data they're producing, the data they're providing to the, to the process. Um, and, you know, now you can start to think about adding, adding new, new links, adding new people into the process, and it doesn't change. It has no impact on people that are currently working. Um, so sort of you know, you've now reached um, sort of that uh, level of scalability that we're talking about. Um, you know, and it's all because they're no longer really sort of focusing on the tools that they're using. Instead, they're sort of designing and doing their process to that interface. Um, and sort of to, to wrap up and sort of summarize, um, you know, we started by looking at uh, sort of the current situation, how it, it really does work quite well uh, for small projects. 
Um, but there's sort of this nascent level of coupling between uh, the designer's task and their role and the tools they're using, they're trying to work with. Um, that leads to sort of a complexity that sort of grows as soon as you start adding more people beyond you know, some, some minimum level. And sort of that complexity sort of grows without bound um, in the current process. And that leads to sort of poor scalability. That sort of leads to the symptoms we sort of talked about. Um, you know, if, if we step back and sort of realize that you can sort of separate out the interoperability problem into a sort of transmission versus a, a translation problem, uh, you sort of see how you can sort of solve the two independently. And you can sort of leave the, the, the transmission layer sort of a separate sort of fundamental layer to build on top of, uh, for example, the flux solving or other people are solving. Um, and start worrying and start focusing your, your attentions uh, more on the translation layer, which is sort of where the, the bread and butter is sort of getting this, all this data flowing uh, sort of in a meaningful way to actually get the design process. In some ways, the design process, just like doing your task in Grasshopper, just arranging a bunch of existing logic, the design process overall, some level, in some ways of looking at it, can be looked at as sort of uh, grouping and sort of arranging the different uh, tasks and sort of making, the, making sure all the, the project work is flowing. Um, you know, and sort of the th part I thought I'd leave with you is sort of stop. Uh, Stop doing your designing around the particular tools and sort of start designing these interfaces and sort of how can you uh, separate yourself uh, from having to worry about how other people do their work. Um, with that, uh, I'll leave you with that.